It wasn't solely my idea, but I really tried as a writer um, to put the subject matter before me. And, and there are a lot of writers who I really admire whose, whose life story is part of the process. I, I love Hunter Thompson's work, for example. But for me, I'm, I'm really trying to take the stories I write about and the subjects I write about and make them, you know, first and foremost. But I, I don't have anything I feel I need to hide or any, no convictions yet or nothing, no, no terrible scandals to, to hide. It came out uh, two years ago and uh, it's an investigative work about the fast food industry in America and its impact on agriculture, our economy, our labor force and um, how we eat and what we look like. Not that much. I, I still pretty much eat what I did before. I just don't eat them, eat these foods in the same places. I don't, I don't go to the big fast food chains anymore. I just don't want to give them my money. Um, having learned how they operate, having learned about their business practices, I choose not to spend my money there. But I, I still like French fries. I just buy them uh, from different venues. I think once they got big to a certain point, they, they really lost touch with a, a kind of a core humanity. Um, they treat workers as though they're completely interchangeable parts of their operating machinery. Uh, they really have not taken responsibility for the impact that they have on our agricultural system and what's happening in their supplier slaughterhouses, etc. So, um, you know, there's a chain that I eat at in California called In-N-Out, and it's a fast food chain, serves pretty much the same foods, but they pay decent wages, it's real food, and I think they've been a huge success, uh, but I think that their success is beginning to wane. Uh, I think the American fast food industry reached its peak around the year 2000 and is now starting to decline and McDonald's lost money for the first time in its history last year and I think people are going to still want fast food but the era of these gigantic centralized restaurant chains uh, serving food that tastes everywhere exactly the same I think may be ending and, and smaller companies are going to prosper. So um, I, don't, I don't think that McDonald's is going to disappear but I, I don't know that it's going to grow at anywhere near the rate it has in the past, and it may even shrink. I started out uh, uh, writing about uh, migrant workers for the Atlantic Monthly and spent uh, almost a year looking at migrant workers and following the harvest. And it was after the editors at Rolling Stone read that piece in which I'd taken all these complex economic and historical forces and told them through the story of your strawberry and where it comes from. Uh, the editors at Rolling Stone asked me to do the same thing uh, for fast food, to, to look behind the counter and take this commodity that we all take for granted and show where it comes from and uh, the systems behind it. I live in New York City. I was born there and I lived there my first 18 years, then went to university and graduate school and uh, lived in Vermont briefly and now live in New York City again. I went to Princeton undergraduate and got a graduate degree in history from Oxford. Uh, Vermont was, seemed like a nice, quiet place to try and be a playwright and a novelist, but it wasn't a very successful experiment. I started out as a, as a fiction writer and was unsuccessful in that and moved to New York City, worked uh, for a film company for a while and was not very happy with that. Got an opportunity to write a brief piece for the Atlantic Monthly. They ran it and then gave me a bigger assignment and that's pretty much what I've been doing ever since. I don't know. Um, you know, I may be like the comedian who, who still wants to do Hamlet, but, I, but part of me thinks I'm better at fiction and, 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 and uh, that sort of writing than I am at this, but I, I can't say why. Maybe I was a lousy novelist, or maybe, maybe it's just the timing wasn't right. It's hard to say. I tried this book, A Reefer Madness. I hoped uh, and tried to get published uh, before Fast Food Nation, um, but publishers weren't interested in it. So it's, it's hard to say how much is the quality of the material and, and how much is the, the marketplace and what the marketplace wants. I, you'd have to ask them. I mean, I, I think that these subjects are relevant. Um, I, I try to write about things I care about and that I think are important. But, you know, times change. Uh, in, the, in the paperback edition of Fast Food Nation at the end, in trying to explain the success of that book, um, I'd like to think it's the brilliance of my prose, but realistically, I think that if, if Fast Food Nation had been published uh, 
five or six years earlier, I, I don't know if it would have found a readership. It, it's very hard to say, you know, why something succeeds or fails in the moment. I think people wrote beautiful books that were published on September 12th or in September of 2001, and no one will ever hear of those books. I, I have friends who've written wonderful books that don't get reviewed, so I, I, I can't really explain the success. I just try to write about what I care about and see what happens. My parents are still alive. My parents are wonderful. Um, I admire my father more than any man I've ever met, and I had a, a very happy childhood. He's in retirement, but he was a television executive. Herbert Schlosser, so Herbert Schlosser of NBC, yeah. He was a television executive for many years. He rose up the ranks, and he was head of NBC at one point. And then, you know, I, I feel like the film network could have been based in some ways on, on what happened to my father. My father represented a very old-fashioned notion of public service and in television, and you know he was involved in all kinds of interesting shows like Laugh-In and comedies. But he also had a, a very strong belief in in public service and documentaries. And and his departure from NBC, I think, was was a turning point. Uh, not because he was leaving, but but that period was a turning point in which ratings became paramount, in which uh, ratings, ratings were suddenly being published in the newspaper in a way that nobody outside the industry ever thought about them. And I think that uh, you know, uh, those notions of fairness, like the Fairness Doctrine, and the idea of having a documentary in prime time about anything except Michael Jackson is, is inconceivable today. But uh, it was a very tough business, very cutthroat business, but in watching my father and growing up, I felt like he was a real uh, man of honor and integrity and was able to succeed without being uh, a slime ball like a lot of people are in that business. He was head of NBC in the early 1970s, and I think he, he left uh, around 1978, something like that. He is 77. He's in semi-retirement. He's an advisor on various telecommunications issues. He worked for RCA after that and was you know, continuing to get involved in new businesses and was helped set up uh, the A&E channel, one of the first uh, big cable channels, and um, has been in, was involved in internet businesses. And he's a very vital, active person. Um, but what was interesting for me is, you know, people have accused Fast Food Nation of being uh, anti-corporate and anti-business. And I'm really not that way at all. I mean, I grew up in that kind of household, and it's just the kind of uh, corporate sensibility of the of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, very, very different from that of the, the 80s and 90s. And so, you know, I grew up where profits were important, but in a household where profits were considered important, but they didn't, you know, they weren't the, the only uh, criterion. Uh, there were other values that mattered as well. Uh, my mother uh, uh, has been uh, involved in, in the dance world. Uh, she worked for many years with the Martha Graham Dance Company um, in New York City. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had an incredibly fortunate upbringing in the sense that my father's work was interesting. It, it encompassed both uh, news and, and the entertainment worlds. And, and my mother has a very literary bent, and, and, and whereas my father would be reading history, my mother would be reading uh, novels and, and fiction, and uh, her father was a, was a painter. So I had a, I, had a very, I had a very stimulating upbringing, very, very fortunate. Liberal. I'm politically, politically independent. I mean, it sounds corny, but, but a lot of my work, and having studied American history extensively, um, is trying to make America live up to its own ideals and, and to try to reconcile what we say we are and who we say we are uh, with how we actually live and, and, and how the government behaves. So again, you know, I've been accused of being anti-corporate, anti-business, a socialist, a communist, and yet in my own mind uh, there have been periods in, in our history where my own view of the world isn't that unusual, uh, isn't that odd. Uh, you know, in terms of fast food nation, the kinds of recommendations that I called for at the end of the book would have been in keeping with what Eisenhower uh, would have had in, in place. If you look at the Eisenhower era, we had strict antitrust enforcement, high proportion of, of labor union membership, 
um, you know, graduated income tax. Uh, so, you know, in defending myself against critics, and, and particularly now with this administration, um, I would say that, you know, the people who are running the Congress and the White House are, are radicals, and, and I don't feel as though I am. On some issues, I'm very liberal politically. Uh, I spent a year looking at murder for the Atlantic Monthly and wrote about the victims' rights movement and, uh, you know, the National Rifle Association distributed that piece and, you know, really liked the piece. So hopefully, if you have a, a complex view of the world, it's not easy to, easy to categorize you. But, but certainly what I've tried to do um, with my investigative work is tell stories that the mainstream uh, media is ignoring for one reason or another and particularly to bring the voices of people whom they ignore uh, to the public, whether it's migrant workers, um, whether it's uh, you know, the meatpacking workers I read about in Fast Food Nation. And so uh, I guess it would take someone else to, to, categor to categorize me neatly. Um, ideally, uh, two different people with two different political points of view could read one of my books, get something from it, come away feeling differently. I mean, I try, I try at the end of each section or I try at the end of the book to propose solutions, to, to, to make recommendations, but the bulk of the work is investigative reporting and, and hopefully is balanced and, and tries to be fair. Nina Hartley. Well, when I interviewed her, if you had you know, passed by us in the restaurant, you would have thought that she was a, an attractive aerobics instructor or maybe a, you know, a sociology graduate student, but she's actually one of the most legendary and, and successful uh, porn actresses uh, in America, and very smart, very articulate, and she described uh, for me the labor practices of the of the industry. Uh, the the three essays in this book, Reefer Madness, uh, you know, are, are about black markets, and in a way, it's a business book. So, in in the in the pornography section, uh, Nina Hartley was a very very uh, good guide to some of the the labor practices in the industry. I learned, you know, what the wage rates are. Uh, I learned what the life is like for, for people who, who uh, work in this industry, for the women who work in this industry. And she wasn't the only porn actress uh, who I interviewed. She was the most articulate, and, and she was one who I, who I put in the book. But, you know, I was trying to get a sense of what is it like to do this job. Um, she's a woman who, you know, is extremely sophisticated, has read widely in political theory, considers herself a feminist, and is very articulate. Uh, most porn actresses don't fit that bill, and she has a, uh, a rosier view of this work and of this industry than, than other people I met, but, but she, was a, she provided a, you know, a lot of insight into how it works and who gets paid and where the money goes, and et cetera, et cetera. No unions in the porn world yet. 11,000 videos, uh, different, different titles, some of those may be, you know, old material re-spliced together, but that's, uh, that's an extraordinary number of titles. Uh, most of them are not stories. Most of them are just uh, scenes of sex uh, cut with one another. But, you know, it, there's been a huge growth in the production of porn. Uh, the VCR, you know, took it out of adult theaters and put it into people's homes, and it's clearly a product that people like a lot and want to buy. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but, but clearly a lot of them. I mean, the, the, the video store rentals, the number of titles that are rented, I think, is 700 and 790 million a year. So when you figure the adult population at about 200 million, that's a lot of people renting porn. Well, Blockbuster I... uh, won't carry porn. So this has been a real boon to independent uh, video stores at a time when they're competing with Blockbuster fiercely uh, these are, you know, these are films that they can rent and earn money from um, at a time when Blockbuster is driving them out of business left and right. So oddly enough, you know, the mom and pop video stores rely a lot more on, on the revenues from porn than uh, the big companies. Ruben Sturman uh, was a figure who played a, a central role in the rise of the pornography industry. And, uh, you know, every industry has these, these great robber barons, these, these magnates. There was a a history book. I'd, I'd love to rattle off the author. I can't remember, but the, the title of it was The Lords of Creation, and it was about the Rockefellers and the Carnegies who built great American industries, and Reuben Sturman was that.
for the porn industry. And, and what struck me about him, that's him. Um, whereas uh, Hugh Hefner and Larry Flint courted publicity and uh, loved to be in the paper, Reuben Sturman, who was much wealthier and more powerful, uh, didn't like any publicity, would appear in public often uh, with wearing disguises. Like here, he's got his Groucho Marx uh, nose on. And um, he, he ran this worldwide porn empire from uh, the suburb of Shaker Heights and suburb of, of Cleveland, Ohio. He's no longer alive. He, he started out as a comic book salesman uh, in Cleveland in the early 1960s, late 1950s, and basically was a successful upper middle class businessman until he started to sell a few uh, girly magazines and branched out from that. And one thing led to another and created this gigantic porn empire. Um, I interviewed him once he finally uh, had been sent to prison by the federal government. The, the federal government started prosecuting him in the early 1960s, and it took almost 30 years for them to really put him away. But I, I interviewed him at the end of his life. That's a very good question. I don't know that there are any rules at the moment. I mean, right now, the federal, uh, federal law forbids the production or distribution of obscene material. That's a law that was passed in 1873. But the question is, what's obscene and what's not? I mean, we all have a fairly good notion of what a murder is um, or what an armed robbery is. That's, a, that's something few of us would argue about. But an obscenity crime is unique in that it occurs in the mind. So uh, whatever a jury says is obscene is obscene. Um, the federal government has tried very hard to keep hardcore porn off the market and in the 1980s in particular under the Reagan and Bush administrations really tried to crack down on porn. Unfortunately juries uh, even in very conservative communities kept on saying hardcore porn wasn't obscene. It's, it's kind of a gray area right now, but nevertheless, some very, very big corporations are making a lot of money off of pornography. And in telling the story of this industry, you know, Reuben Sturman being the, the robber baron who, who really gets it in, into being a gigantic worldwide industry, he passes from the scene, and the people who are making a lot of money um, from porn now have names like AOL Time Warner, um, Hilton, Marriott, um, they are distributing via satellite and cable and in their hotel rooms material that could easily have gotten you sent to prison in the early 1960s, maybe even in the early 1970s. Hardcore porn would be sexually explicit material uh, in which the sex acts are unmistakably real um, as opposed to simulated, uh, you know, R-rated, you know, uh, Hollywood films, maybe they're actually um, having sex, maybe they're not, but in hardcore, they really are, and it's visibly so. I mean, these are, these are rough estimates. About 460, 500 million a year uh, of porn is, is sold via cable and satellite, and uh, upwards of 200 million uh, via hotels. So that's a, that's a lot of money. He just, you know, he was, he, he was in the Army Air Force during World War II, got involved in a candy distributorship uh, in Cleveland, uh, met somebody who had access to remaindered comic books. These were comic books that were supposed to be returned to the publisher and shredded, but he got them cheaply somehow and was able to sell them for a very small amount of money. And he just set up this magazine distribution network in Cleveland, going to local candy stores and mom and pop stores with his remaindered comic books and later crossword puzzle books, et cetera, et cetera. And he just happened to be in the right place in the right time, or ultimately maybe the wrong place in the wrong time, uh, he had a distribution network. And at that very time, uh, Playboy was successful. And there were a lot of imitators of Playboy. And this was very risque to show women without their shirts on. And his distribution network was perfect for selling these girly magazines. So he started out uh, in the Midwest distributing girly magazines. And gradually, his empire grew. And uh, as films became part of the porn world, uh, he put in these peep booths, which showed uh, you know, a film loop of, of sexual activity. And that was incredibly profitable. He put them uh, in the back of the store, in, in, in a booth with a door that could be locked. And there had been stag films uh, you know, dating back to the beginning of the 20th century that were shown at college fraternities and Kiwanis clubs. And the, the peep booth allowed men to, to have a, a stag film for one. <laughs>
uh, and close the door and lock the door and feed quarters into this machine. And it was incredibly, incredibly profitable. So within a relatively brief period of time, Sturman came to dominate the production and the distribution of hardcore pornography, not just in the United States, but also throughout the world, uh, in Western Europe as well. Well, not all conservatives, but, but one of the things I look at uh, in the porn section uh, is the, the public morality and uh, the desire to, stipe, to, to stamp out vice and these, these moral crusades and the underlying reality, not just about how people are, are really behaving, but even within the same person. You see this public desire to stamp out vice and then this private desire to indulge in it. I mean, uh, one, one example would be Father Bruce Ritter, who was a member of uh, President Reagan's Mies Commission to investigate pornography. And, and Ritter was very adamant by day uh, that homosexuality should be included in the commission's purview and that homosexuality should be officially condemned. Um, and by night, he was cruising uh, for young male prostitutes. And again and again, you see in our history this, this kind of obsession with pornography in some people being combined with a, with a real desire to indulge in it. Now, I'm not saying that of all conservatives by any means or of all critics of pornography. There are a lot of people who criticize it, and, and rightly so, on its, on its content. But when you look at America, um, we have some of the toughest laws on pornography in the Western world, but we watch more porn, we produce more porn, you know, we have a pornographic culture, and the same is true you know, for the other section of the book on marijuana. We have some of the toughest marijuana laws in the Western world. I mean, you can get a life sentence without parole for a first-time marijuana offense, but we grow more marijuana, you know, we smoke more pot, we, we write more songs about pot. I think that speaks to a very deeply conflicted uh, American psyche and, and culture on these issues. He had to step down from, uh, he was the head of Covenant House, and uh, it was revealed, I, I believe, one of the young men, Covenant House was a place in New York City for, for runaways, a, a Catholic charity, and one of the runaways uh, had, you know, came out publicly and said that he had been paid um, to have sex with Father Ritter, and there was a scandal that involved uh, his behavior, and he had to, he had to step down. And Charles Keating was a, was a, it's interesting that a lot of these people come from roughly the same place. I mean, Larry, Larry Flint was from Ohio, Reuben Sturman was from Ohio, Charles Keating, who became the nation's biggest anti-pornography crusader, also from Ohio. And uh, starting the late 1950s onward, he was really uh, the, the foremost American opponent of sexually explicit material. But his interest in the subject, you know, from my point of view, just seemed a little bit uh, excessive. And in the book, I quote from uh, one of his appearances uh, in Congress, where, you know, in order to make his point uh, and his organization, you know, making its point about pornography, they're reading into the congressional record in front of young people who have come to the Congress that day to, to watch these hearings, you know, relatively explicit sexual material. Um, and uh, he wound up uh, being involved in, in the collapse of Lincoln Savings and Loan, uh, you know, a huge uh, bank scandal in the 1980s. He was a Keating Five. And I think ultimately, you know, a lot of the crusaders against vice are human too. And, and I think should be more forgiving of, of human faults. Um, you know, he who is in glass houses, that, that, old, that old quote. And yet we have these periodic campaigns against vice that are very moralistic and very unforgiving, ultimately. I mean, I'm not justifying people who smoke too much pot or people who make pornography that's, you know, upsetting, but, but this desire to be purer than pure and, and condemn others for their personal habits is, is very American. And if you look at the history of this country, we were founded by Puritans, I mean, literally by Puritans. Um, but at the same time, this country has a very rebellious and iconoclastic history and tradition. And I think through all these issues, you see this ongoing battle between the Puritan uh, part of our culture and, uh, and the very rebellious and iconoclastic, you know, uh, dissenting tradition that we have. When, uh, when uh, marijuana was really being debated, um, in the late 1960s and, and early 1970s, uh, Nixon appointed a commission uh, 
to investigate what should be done uh, about marijuana in America and whether it should be legalized or kept illegal or decriminalized. And when the commission that was appointed came out in favor of decriminalization, um, he blamed it on the Jews, and um, and that never happened. Uh, th those recommendations were never were never carried out. Yeah. Philip Harvey is a is a very interesting figure, who today runs one of the largest mail order, probably the largest mail order pornography companies uh, in America. But he runs it uh, from North Carolina, and he leads a he leads a double life. He's a very articulate, very intelligent, Harvard educated uh, expert in family planning. And he uses uh, many, much of the profit from his pornography empire to fuel charitable work uh, throughout the developing countries. And started out selling, you know, birth control. And uh, that same 1873 law that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Comstock Act, that forbade obscene material from being distributed, also forbade the distribution of information about birth control through the mails. So Harvey started selling. Uh, condoms and other birth control information through the mails, fought the, fought the government in the early uh, 1970s to do that, gradually branched out to sexually explicit materials, and he's like a character out of a play by George Bernard Shaw in the sense that he is so, per he seems so conservative personally and, and seems very patrician um, and seems like an academic, and you would never think in a million years that here is one of the most uh, influential and wealthy pornographers uh, in the United States. And he, uh, he, you know, believes in what he does. He uses the profits, for the most part, you know, for, for good ends. And uh, he, he takes the, the products that he sells and subjects it to, you know, a, a commission of sex therapists to make sure there's nothing, you know, horrible about it. And he's an interesting, interesting character. I did. I interviewed him. And he, he stood up to the, to the Bush administration, the first Bush administration's uh, war on pornography, uh, because the government realized that they couldn't get juries to convict people for obscene material. They came up with a strategy of uh, indicting uh, people in, in many, dis many different districts at once. So Harvey was indicted again and again, and the strategy was not to win any individual case, but to come with so many indictments that you'd have to plea bargain and go out of business because, you know, the government can afford to, to press eight or nine cases at once, but most individuals can't defend themselves in that many venues. I can't remember the exact number, but it's, I think it's the biggest private employer in this little town. And this is Phil Harvey's huge mail order uh, operation. It's run out of Hillsborough, North Carolina, selling, you name it, selling hardcore videos, selling sexual devices, selling... Uh, books, very the kinds of things that you find in a in a New York City sex shop, but he argues that this is the most socially responsible way uh, to sell this material. Um, you're not imposing it on anyone. Uh, you, you know, you're not you're not putting it into anyone's face. The marketing or anything like that. It's done by it's done through the mail. It's done very discreetly, and this is a very conservative community that doesn't seem to mind um, his business and and most of. His employees are women, and um, I went into the warehouse and I just saw this vast, high-tech warehouse um, in which you know all these packages are being sorted, and very dainty, white-haired Southern women are are handling material that you would not normally think that they would be uh, handling and packaging and boxing. But I think you know if you visit that operation, you you get a sense of how much a part of the mainstream in America this material has become and these objects uh, have become. In his own area, uh, juries won't convict him because they believe that adults should be able to see what they want to see in the privacy of, of their own homes. Um, this is a far cry from the early 1960s, again, when Reuben Sturman was starting out. Uh, Lenny Bruce, the comedian, was imprisoned for saying a few swear words, which I won't say in this show, during his nightclub act. Um, it's remarkable uh, what you could be prosecuted for in the, in the early 60s. And what you'd see on HBO today is far more explicit than what people were sent to prison for uh, 30, 35 years ago. Rich Rossfelder was a, was a federal agent uh, and, uh, in uh, Cleveland with the Organized Crime Strike Force. And he became intrigued with Reuben Sturman, this, this porn magnate of Cleveland, because no one really knew much about him. And the FBI had been trying for more than a decade to get Sturman uh, indicted and convicted on obscenity charges. 
But the more that Rosfelder learned about Sturman's operation, the more he thought that Sturman was a multi-million dollar tax cheat, and Rosfelder was a criminal investigator for the IRS. And in order to avoid giving money to the government, Sturman had created an unbelievably Byzantine uh, corporate structure, the sort of thing that Enron created uh, a couple of decades later, to shift money from various off through various offshore corporations and offshore banks. And you know, Sturman felt that he had no obligation to subsidize the government that was trying to put him into prison. So Rossfelder uh, started investigating Sturman, I think, in 1975, and spent almost 20 years pursuing him doggedly um, throughout the world uh, to, to build a, a case against him, and eventually did bring him down. But a very honorable, Rossfelder, a very good guy, a very honorable guy, and, and really, to me, a, a model public servant. I, I, I don't think that uh, that Rich is a, is a great fan of pornography, but what offended him was the idea, here was a multi-million dollar tax cheat, and, uh, and a very arrogant one. Um, Sturman had a lot of hubris. Uh, he, after the first time the FBI raided his, uh, his warehouse in 63, he responded by suing J. Edgar Hoover. Now, this was at the height of Hoover's power. So Sturman was a very arrogant guy who really believed in his own intellect and his own abilities. And it's, it's remarkable how many times Sturman did beat the federal government and how close he came even to winning the tax case. Uh, you know, as I write in the book, uh, he, tried to, he tried to tamper with the jury. And after spending, you know, almost two decades pursuing Reuben Sturman, Rossfelder is quite blunt now about how if Sturman had managed to tamper with the jury and there'd been a mistrial, Sturman might have walked free and, uh, and never gone to prison. In the middle of the trial, uh, um, Sturman had a very attractive young wife, and uh, there was a young male juror uh, who received a note from her. And the juror had no idea this was the lead defendant's wife, but, uh, but the note suggested they meet later on, and he wound up going out to dinner with her. And uh, she clearly offered him, um, uh, she, she tried to persuade him to, uh, to find Sturman not guilty. And it's quite possible that a different juror, this juror, this juror wound up voting to convict, but a different juror uh, might have accepted uh, money or sexual favors in return for a, a not guilty plea. And that would have been the end of the government case, and, and Sturman might have walked free. No, I didn't. In, in focusing on uh, Sturman and his career, I, again, this is, this, this is about, the, the, the section's about pornography, but it's a business. It's a business piece. It, it's, it's a, the book is a business book, and I really tried not to get too involved in his personal life. I never sought out his children. Um, I never sought out his ex-wives. Um, I wasn't as interested in that personal side of his life, but just in how he built this empire. She was, she was later uh, sent to prison, though, for her role in tampering with the jury. So they did catch her on this. And, and so, you know, in writing about family members, I, I tried to write about them to the degree that you know, they were convicted of various crimes, but not to get into his personal life. I, I, can't, I, I can't remember the number, but it seemed as though he was tried every two years or so on federal obscenity, on state obscenity charges. Again and again, he was tried for the content of the material that he was selling, and he beat the rap every single time. And every time that he beat the rap, his stature grew even larger uh, in the porn industry. He was adamant about beating the federal government, and he would... Uh, subsidize the legal fees of other people in the industry, even if they were rivals, if they would stand up to the government. Uh, and it wasn't until the end, uh, when he'd already been convicted uh, on tax charges, that he decided to plead guilty to an obscenity charge uh, in Las Vegas. Um, and so if you, if you think of the federal government tried to get him on obscenity charges dating back to 1963, and it took, uh, it took 28 years for them to get him on a single charge. He had brilliant lawyers, and he was willing to fight, you know, any, any indictment. Well, you know, an IRS agent would be better versed than me to tell you what the taxation uh, implications are, but Sturman really pioneered all kinds of very innovative methods of, of money laundering. And, you know, by trying to get the money offshore, he didn't want to just park it offshore. He wanted to be able to use it in the United States. So he would set up various uh, corporations or establishments. Uh, he did it in Liechtenstein. Uh, he did it in Panama. He did it in the Cayman Islands. 
and then those offshore corporations would be making investments in the United States. And the IRS doesn't have access uh, to offshore corporations and, and their books. But, you know, towards the end of, of, of my book, I talk about how what, what Sturman was doing and pioneering uh, many corporations uh, in the United States, you know, I'm sure they've looked at the tax law very carefully, are not breaking the law and doing it, but the strategy has been similar uh, to avoid paying taxes in the United States. Uh, there's been a big boom in the last 10 years of what are called inversion transactions, which is American companies that have all their facilities in the United States taking out a mailbox um, overseas and calling themselves foreign corporations to avoid paying tax. In, in Sturman's case, he didn't want to pay taxes for, so, for philosophical reasons. He didn't want to give this government that was trying to put him in prison a single penny. But I think he also wanted to enjoy as much of his money as, as he could. He died, I think, in 1997. He died in a federal prison. And by then, you know, when I met him, he, he was like a, a proud and deposed head of state. Um, he claimed to be completely broke, although that's never really been proven if he was. I mean, he might have had millions of dollars parked in offshore accounts that Rossfelder and the IRS never found. And the porn industry had moved on. I mean, it had become corporate. It had these relationships with the satellites and the, and the cable companies, and Sturman increasingly seemed like a, a figure from the shadowy past. There were allegations that Sturman had links to organized crime, to the Gambino family. And um, so by the time I met him, he was a, a very bright, very articulate, lonely man in a, in a prison in Kentucky whose time had clearly passed. Well, I, I've got to be careful that the, the source notes never become longer than the actual book. Um, I believe in transparency as much as possible uh, with the work. And, and the same was true with Fast Food Nation. Um, for readers who are interested in something I've written who want to read more about it, the source notes are there. For readers who don't believe what I'm saying um, and want to see where that came from and, and check it for themselves, the source notes are there. Uh, for people who might think of suing me for libel, the source notes are there. Um, so I'm trying to, trying to be very careful as a journalist and also not rely on um, unnamed sources and, 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 and expect the reader just to take my word that these things are true. Uh, if you look at Fast Food Nation and you look at this book, there are a, lo there are a lot of things in it um, that are potentially controversial that haven't been written about extensively before. And I'm not expecting anyone um, to just take my word on it. And, and so I'll, I'm going to try to keep the source notes under control for the next book. But I feel you know, there are no footnotes in the text. So people who want to read the book and never look at the source notes, that's just fine. But people who are curious or questioning or litigious can, can look at the source notes and, and, uh, and see that it's all, it's all there where I got there. I like it. I like, that, uh, I like that there's that pull quote from the book, um, which gives you on the cover you know, one of the central themes of the book, which is that these black markets and the mainstream um, are pretty much linked together. And I, and I try in the book to show that this is one country, America, and uh, there's something artificial about dividing these markets from the rest of our markets. It's huge, and, and economists agree that it's really been growing since around 1970, but what its actual size is, nobody knows. I mean, I, I try to use statistics from a conservative Austrian economist who is doing work for the International Monetary Fund. His estimates are 8 to 10 percent of our gross domestic product. That would be about a trillion dollars. Um, when the IRS in 1998 looked at how much money you know, uh, people were evading in taxes, they came up with an estimate of $200 billion was not being paid in taxes. And that would mean about a trillion and a half dollars in income was not being reported. And that doesn't include illegal activity. So it's huge. It's gigantic. Mark Young uh, was a hippie biker uh, who I wrote about in the marijuana section of the book. And uh, he's no saint, but, uh, but he's certainly uh, no serial killer. He's from Indiana in uh, Indianapolis, and uh, he was involved uh, in a marijuana deal. He didn't grow the pot, he didn't sell the pot or distribute it, but he introduced a grower uh, to a distributor and took a cut on some of their sales. And when this uh, marijuana growing operation was shut down, uh, 
Uh, Mark Young refused to cooperate with the government, refused to testify against anybody, refused to admit that he was guilty. He's a very proud marijuana smoker. And as a result, for his first marijuana crime, he was sentenced to life uh, without parole and sent to a very scary federal penitentiary in Kansas. I did. And that was, uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, Leavenworth Penitentiary is a very scary building. And it was designed to be that way. It was the first federal penitentiary. And it's very strange. Its architecture is modeled on that of the US Capitol building. But it's, it's this you know, citadel. The, the Capitol building is like our, our symbol of freedom. But somehow they've transformed that into a symbol of very, it's a scary place. Very, very, uh, I keep on saying that, an old prison uh, and uh, very dangerous very, you know, that's where they send convicted international terrorists and, and killers. And um, here was this hippie biker uh, there for a pot deal. He was, oh gosh, he's probably about 48 now. He was in his mid-30s when he got sent to prison. He wound up after, uh, after I wrote about him for the Atlantic Monthly and after the article came out, his life sentence was reduced um, to 12 years, which is still longer than the typical convicted killer uh, spends in prison in the United States. So in the marijuana section, I'm trying to come to terms with how do we punish someone more for marijuana in America uh, than for killing somebody with a gun? It's, it's, it's generally uh, a, a very certain kind of moralistic conservative who has uh, led the prohibition of marijuana and is in favor of these very tough sentences. Uh, the current drug czar, uh, John Waters, is in favor of increasing some of the penalties for marijuana. And yet there are other conservatives uh, who come from a much more libertarian uh, tradition and not as much of a moralistic tradition, uh, like William Buckley, uh, Milton Friedman, George Shultz, who have called for the decriminalization of marijuana. And, and the traditional political labels don't always apply when it comes to the war on drugs. A lot of the tough legislation was eagerly sponsored by liberal Democrats. And we've had one president who's admitted to having a joint in his mouth, which was Bill Clinton. And more people were uh, sent to prison and arrested for marijuana during the Clinton administration uh, than during any other presidency. More people were sent to prison while Clinton uh, was president than during any other, any other presidency. The, the reason that I wrote, you know, in the, the way that the book works is that marijuana is a black market commodity. Uh, illegal immigrants are black market labor. And then pornography is an example of how a little black market becomes mainstream. Uh, I, you know, I wrote about marijuana and not cocaine for a number of reasons. It's the most widely used illegal drug in the United States. It's the most popular. And it's also the one that we produce here. You can't blame this problem on Colombian cartels. This is an all-American crop. It's being grown you know, not just in Northern California or Hawaii, which is, uh, or Kentucky, which are the popular uh, stereotypes of marijuana growing. But I wrote about a, a, a very profitable marijuana farm in Indiana. Um, it's being grown widely in Illinois, um, in Missouri. And uh, no one knows for sure, but, uh, but I believe, and I contend in the book, that most of the marijuana being grown in the United States is coming from the farm belt. And it, some people believe it's our largest cash crop in the United States. Corn. Uh, is our corn crop is worth about nineteen billion dollars. Some people think our marijuana crop may be worth as much as twenty five billion. But in any event it's huge because, you know, apples, which is our biggest fruit, I mean that's about a billion dollars a year. And so even if it's five billion or ten billion in marijuana, that's a huge, huge American industry. And and again, coming out of the heartland. That's a that's a rough estimate that comes from an old uh, federal drug uh, investigative report. But clearly, if 20 million people are smoking it a year, um, you need a lot of people to grow it. And the, the estimate of, of 2 million a day smoking it and 20 million a year, these come from government surveys in which people are asked if they smoke marijuana. And most likely, that understates the number considerably because given the marijuana laws that we have now, I think a fair number of people aren't going to tell the government sincerely and honestly if they're, if they're using marijuana or growing it. No, um, it's a very unusual uh, type of crime in the sense that a marijuana crime can be subject to local law, state law, and federal law simultaneously. And as a matter of fact, if you're arrested with some marijuana and found innocent under local law, your, under your state law, the federal government could still prosecute you for the same marijuana 
and send you to prison. I mean, I write about a marijuana grower in Florida who was found innocent uh, or who was given a, a very minor sentence under state law and then was prosecuted for the same marijuana under federal law and given a, given a life sentence. It, it varies. It, it entirely depends on who arrests you, who decides to prosecute you, and what they decide to prosecute you for. And one of the big themes of this section is the amazing increase in prosecutorial power as a result, because under federal law, marijuana is illegal in every state of the union in any amount. So technically, the federal government could prosecute anybody arrested for marijuana anywhere in the United States. In practical terms, they don't do that. But if there's a prosecutor who doesn't like you and really wants to cause you a hard time, you can be in big trouble, even for you know, relatively small amounts of marijuana. Very, very hard to calculate. And the best estimate I could come up with is about 20,000 in federal prison, 30, 35,000 in, um, in state prison. And jail is very hard to guess, but a lot. The, the one area that's looked at uh, marijuana arrests for possession, just for simple possession of marijuana, and, and who goes to jails. In, in Maryland, they did a study, and they found that one out of every four people arrested went to jail for at least a night, and one out of every six arrested went to jail for at least a week. And that's a lot of people when you figure that nationwide about 700,000 people are arrested for pot every year. And, and that's more than for any other drug. I'm married, um, and I have two kids, and they're 10 and 12, and I, I look forward to the day when I let them read one of my books. So far, um, my daughter is maybe a year or so away from that. This is, these are very disturbing subjects often. I mean, in, in Fast Food Nation, you know, the meatpacking section is, uh, is, very, is very graphic and, and I think very upsetting. And, uh, you know, I think I'll wait a year or so before I want my daughter reading about hardcore pornography. You know, I, I want them to obey the law. I, I've really seen the consequences of seeming, seemingly trivial um, offenses and how that can destroy a life. I mean, if, if you're caught with any amount of marijuana and convicted um, of a misdemeanor, you can have student loans taken away for life. Uh, so I'd like them to obey the law, but I'd also like them to grow up questioning the law and not just accepting the status quo and, and thinking for themselves. So, you know, um, try to give them a sound moral foundation and then they're going to have to figure out these issues for themselves. I mean, I'd never been in a prison before in my life, before visiting Leavenworth Penitentiary uh, to see Mark Young locked up there for pot. And in looking at our drug laws and in looking at the black market, and uh, it really made me think about our prison system and who's in prison and why. And, and that's the next book. I've got to. I've got to finish writing it. I'd say a year and a half, something like that. Um, absolutely no complaint. Um, to be able to write about what you care about and to get it published, and you know what I'm trying to do is make people think about these issues. So to the degree that there can be a public discussion of them because of what I've written, no complaints. I'm wary to claim any cosmic global credit for anything that I've written. I've found individual people that I've met um, have told me that it changed their eating habits or it changed their view of things, and, and that's very gratifying. I think that a lot of the issues I dealt with in Fast Food Nation are now part of the public debate, and maybe that would have happened anyway, but, but, uh, but I feel it's, that, that was a very gratifying experience. Thank you.